Good afternoon. Thank you all for attending today's Trademarks webinar series presentation, Representation, Signatures, and Ethical Issues in Trademark Prosecution, Practical Information for Attorneys. A link to today's slides was included in the email you received with the link to join today's presentation. This session is being recorded and will be made available for viewing on the USPTO website and YouTube channel within two to three weeks of the presentation date today. Our presenters for today's webinar are Kathleen Cooney Porter, Senior Trademark Advisor to the USPTO Director, Robert Lavash, Senior Trademark Legal Policy Advisor, and David Mayer, a Trademark Legal Policy Attorney. If you have any questions during the presentation, simply type them in the chat window to all panelists. There will be time for questions, there will be time for answers from the presenters at the end of the session. If we do not get to your question, or if you are watching a recording of this presentation, please email your question to tmpolicy at uspto.gov. That email address will be um, posted on the last slide of the presentation as well. Today's presentation will cover the following topics. General ethical considerations for practitioners, recognition as a representative, Signature requirements and authority to sign. Rule 1118, signature as certification. Considerations for proof of use audits and addressing misconduct before the USPTO. And now I will turn it over to Kathleen Cooney Porter. So good afternoon or good morning everyone and depending on where you're watching the presentation, it's a pleasure for, for us to be here. Um, so I'll be uh, starting us off with some general ethical considerations um, before practicing before the USPTO. So attorney, attorneys practicing before the office are subject to the rules of professional responsibility set forth by their individual states of admission. All practitioners engaged in practice before the office are subject to disciplinary jurisdiction of the office. So USPTO rules of professional conduct. A practitioner shall provide competent representation to a client. A practitioner shall reasonably consult with their client about the means by which the client's objectives are to be accomplished, keep the client reasonably informed about the status of the matter, and shall explain a matter to the extent reasonably necessary to permit the client to make informed decisions regarding the representation. A practitioner shall not practice law in a jurisdiction in violation of the regulations of the legal profession in that jurisdiction and or assist another in doing so. General ethical considerations. What is passed before the office in trademark matters? Practice before the office is a very broad term that includes any related any law related service that comprehends any matter connected with the representation to the office or any of its officers or employees relating to a client's rights, privileges, duties, or responsibilities under the laws or the regulations administered by the office for the registration of the trademark. So this list may include, not exhaustive, um, preparing necessary documents in contemplation of filing the documents with the office, corresponding and communicating with the office on behalf of a party, consulting with and giving advice to clients concerning matters pending or contemplated to be presented before the office, planning, preparing and prosecuting an application for trademark registration, and also preparing an amendment, which may require written arguments to establish the registrability of a trademark. So see generally 37 CFR section 11.5. Most USPT employees that attorneys communicate with here are also attorneys and are bound by the rules of professional conduct as well. USPT employees may not provide legal advice or opinions about trademark rights, trademark infringement claims, or the validity of a trademark registration. USPTO employees may not discuss an application directly with a representative applicant unless 
the attorney is also part of the conversation. USPTO employees may not discuss the merits of any particular application or registration with a third party. General ethical considerations. So additional rules to keep in mind. Rule 2.11e, providing false, fictitious, or fraudulent information in connection with the requirements for providing accurate domicile information shall be deemed submitting a paper for an improper purpose in violation of section 11.18b of this chapter and subject to sanctions and actions provided in section 11.18c. Rule 2.192, trademark applicants, registrants, and parties to the proceedings before the Trademark Town Appeal Board and their attorneys or agents are required to conduct their business with decorum and courtesy. Documents presented in violation of this requirement will be submitted to the director and will be returned by the director's direct authority. So see generally 37 CFR section 11.5. I'll hand it back over. Yeah, you have new Can you hear me now? Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to talk briefly about uh, what it takes to be recognized as a representative before the office. Um, there are basically three ways that one could be rep recognized as a representative um, in a trademark case. Um, they're set forth in, in Rule 2.17. And they, these, these change slightly um, in connection with the U.S. Council rule update fairly recently, and it provides great flexibility in how one can appear. Um, the, the clearest way is to be uh, appointed in a properly signed power of attorney, which is usually done with the CAR form, the change of address and representation form through T's. Another way to do it is to sign any document on behalf of an applicant, registrant, or party to a proceeding who's not already represented by another attorney. Um, and the third way, which is kind of the catch-all, is to appear by being identified as the representative in any document submitted to the office on behalf of an applicant, registrant, or other party who is not already represented by a qualified practitioner. Now, that third one is very broad. We do read into that that the, um, the attorney has consented to this representation. We have had a few instances where an attorney has been appointed without their knowledge, which is very rare and can be addressed by contacting the policy office. There's a little delay on the slides, I apologize. So what does it mean to have a party who's already represented? Um, representation uh, recognized during the pendency of an application is continued to, it, it, it continues until the attorney is either revoked or is replaced by a new attorney at a different firm. But when ownership changes or the mark registers or the application abandons, the office considers the recognition of the power of attorney to automatically end. Um, very often we will have, um, you know, the, the information will stay in the record post-registration, and we do that as a courtesy, but the next attorney then to file a document post-registration can technically appear by doing so. Um, so we, we understand also that when somebody submits a document in connection with a maintenance filing, we will recognize that attorney to be the attorney of record until that maintenance filing is either accepted or finally rejected. And with that, I'm going to pass it on to Bob. Thanks, David, and good afternoon, everyone. So let's talk a little bit about how one would sign a submission to the office. We have two main forms that we accept. One is an electronic signature, and that's the electronic signature that is provided for in our rules. And that is essentially any comb combination of letters, numbers, spaces, or punctuation marks that the signatory has adopted as a signature placed between two forward slash symbols. So 
generally, if it meets those requirements under the rules, we accept the signature. Um, but of course, we'll get to the authority to sign in some later slides. The other form of signature that we accept is the traditional pen and ink signature. And the way that you would submit that signature to us is by having whoever signing it sign it along with the declaration, verification, or averments that are being um, signed, scanning those into a, a JPEG or a PDF file, and then uploading, uploading that as an attachment to the T submission. The other thing I want to mention here is the sort of mechanism for having someone else sign electronically a submission when you're not the one who's going to sign it and you're not with the person who is signing it. Um, and we have uh, what we call e-sign-on, and it's a method of completing the document and then providing a link for the signature to be entered uh, to whoever the signatory is. Once they review that document and then uh, enter their signature, they can then return it to the party who will be submitting uh, the, the form after they complete it. Uh, so now let's talk about uh, what our rules require in terms of the electronic signature and the handwritten signature. In both cases, the signature has to be personally entered in the case of an electronic signature or personally signed in the case of a uh, pen and ink signature. Now, if you take a look at Rule 2.193, you'll see that it includes the language indicating that you could use some other form of electronic signature specified by the director. Uh, but presently, we don't have any such um, other forms. Um, I know that um, document signing software is very popular now. That currently under our rules for most types of signature, uh, are, it's not permitted currently. Uh, we are looking into that. Very important here when we're talking about ethics and what our rules require, um, Another person may not sign the name of an attorney or other authorized uh, signatory. So whoever's designated as a signatory actually has to personally enter that signature. That means that a paralegal or a legal assistant or a secretary or anyone else could not enter a, an electronic signature uh, on behalf of the person signing. And an important note here, uh, and we'll get more into this sort of ethical obligations later in the presentation, but under uh, Rule 11.303, a practitioner owes a duty of candor to the office and may not permit the submission of a false statement um, or fact of law. So that, of course, would or could apply to improperly signed documents submitted to the office. Um, moving on. Signatures have to be a real person. So when you identify the signatory, um, it has to be a, a, a person. It can't be the company name, for instance. And our, our rules also require that the first and last name and the title or position of the person who signs must be set forth below or adjacent to the signature. Um, we, are, we read that adjacent wording fairly broadly. Um, so in... in many cases, if it's somewhere else in the filing and it's otherwise properly done, we will accept that. So here are a couple of examples of signatures that are, are never acceptable. The first example here at the top shows that the signator, signatory name and the signature itself identify a company name. There's no real person identified. So as I mentioned, that would not be an acceptable signature, it should be rejected by the examining attorney and would trigger uh, a requirement in an office action. Um, and in the next example, you see there's no signature provided at all. That also, of course, would trigger a, uh, an office action. Um, I should also note here under Rule 1118A, uh, each piece of correspondence filed by a practitioner in the office must bear a signature, either personally signed or inserted by the practitioner. Uh, now, we don't traditionally uh, strictly enforce that. So if a, a signature is omitted, we don't necessarily consider that a violation. But if we see a pattern of behavior, that could lead to further inquiry. 
With that, I will turn it over to David for authority to sign. Thanks, Bob. And I, I think part of the authority to sign question might actually answer one of the questions we've received from uh, from the audience uh, regarding why uh, we require different people to sign a power of attorney at different stages. So let me jump in by saying that when somebody has to sign a document before the office, we need the proper person to do it. But the proper person will depend on what type of submission we're talking about. We generally split these into four different categories. We, we have verifications of fact, then the responses, amendments, requests, and petitions, and then power of attorney, and then this catch-all, we, we say mixed documents. And what is meant by mixed documents is essentially those situations where the document does multiple things. A lot of our forms through T's allow you to do things like make an amendment, but also change out the attorney. Um, so let's start by verifications of fact. These are primarily applications, allegations of use, requests for extensions of, to file a statement of use, a petition to revive, or any sort of declaration. Um, so for these, we're talking about um, any person with legal authority to bind the applicant, a qualified attorney representing the applicant, or, and this is very broad, a person with firsthand knowledge of the facts and actual or implied authority to act on behalf of the applicant. And generally, we're not going to question the authority of the person who signs any sort of verification of facts unless there is some inconsistency in the record. Um, which is qu quite rare. For responses, amendments, and requests, and these are governed by several different rules, uh, this is for any response for an office action, any request for abandonment, a request to divide, petitions to the director, requests to make any real change to the record, so that includes addresses um, and uh, amendments to the application if you're changing out the ID, uh, for instance. If there is an attorney appointed, an attorney must sign these types of, re of, of submissions. Um, if, the attorney, if there is no attorney, it has to be signed by somebody with legal authority to bind the applicant or registrant. And for joint applicants or registrants, everybody must sign. Um, for juristic entities, it, it's not just that the person signs. We also have to know that the person has the authority to represent the juristic entity by virtue of his or her uh, title or position. So for juristic entities, and this is relevant for later too, when we're talking about who can bind a juristic entity, for uh, the TMEP has a lot of different examples for all different types of, of these entities. Domestic corporations are, of course, probably the most popular. There, we want a corporate officer. We want the president, the chief financial officer, um, somebody with a, a, a corporate title. For a limited liability company, we're looking for somebody who has the title manager, owner, principal, or member. It's a little bit more broad. And for most other types of, of entities, it, again, the person who, who can bind the, the company. Um, I will say also that we will take, uh, we, examining attorneys especially, are trained to recognize titles like CEO. Uh, they'll say, if they see SVP, they'll understand that this, that's a senior vice president. It's unacceptable, though, for a juristic entity to sign um, as a trademark coordinator or agent of or just authorized signatory. The exception being that if the record shows that this person has already been has been recognized, um, if the president of the corporation signs the application and then signs later as authorized signatory, we'll presume that they have not changed positions and, and we'll, we'll accept that. Um, I will note that general counsel and in-house counsel, um, there's, there's a couple things to keep in mind. An in-house counsel or, or any sort of general counsel is qualified to practice before the office as an attorney. However, unless they also have a corporate equivalent title, they can't sign as a corporate officer. So um, what we're saying by that is that somebody identified as in-house counsel may sign a response and an amendment if that person is currently recognized as the attorney of record, but that person may not revoke the authority of a previously appointed attorney unless they do so in their capacity as somebody who's able to legally bind the applicant. So if you're trying to, uh, as in-house counsel, revoke the authority of outside counsel, um, you'd have to sign it as general counsel and senior vice president, um, if that's the accurate title. If the general counsel is not an officer, they would have to have an officer sign that particular document. Um, 
So for a power of attorney, that's a good segue to uh, how do we change out the attorney. So that has to be signed by an individual applicant, registrant, or party to, a, to the proceeding, or by somebody with legal authority to bind the applicant, registrant, or party. So um, once an attorney is designated, the name practitioner is allowed to, to sign an associate power of attorney appointing another qualified practitioner. But we, we note that revocation of the primary attorney attorney's power also revokes any associate power of attorney. Um, so in-house counsel could be recognized as the attorney. They're not recognized as someone with legal authority to bind the app in a registrant unless that person is also an officer. So um, very often we, we would suggest that um, if an application is filed by the in-house counsel, later on that in-house counsel can appoint um, a outside counsel to file responses on their behalf because that would be essentially um, an associate power of attorney. So what about these mixed submissions? So mixed submissions are these, again, these examples are um, where the T's form allows multiple things to happen. Um, each portion of the submission has to be considered separately to determine if it's properly signed. So if an attorney is appointed, the attorney must sign the response and the voluntary amendments, but the applicant may sign the declaration that's contained in a response or amendment. But if, it's, if the response portion is not properly signed, then that declaration can't be considered. Um, this, is a, this is an area that uh, we're planning to provide additional clarification for in the next TMAP update. And with that, um, we're going to get to the fun part. Um, we're going to do uh, some interactive stuff, and I'm going to pass it over to Kathleen again. Um, or if I do this correctly. Oh, there we go. Okay. As uh, David said, now for the fun part. Um, so our first hypo hypothetical is uh, an individual applicant how we do it submits his own application pro se. After receiving a complicated looking office action, he asks his criminal defense attorney niece, Ivana Help, to take a close look and see if she can help. So Ivana takes a look and realizes that the issues are fairly straightforward. So she fills out the response without checking out the box to indicate a new attorney is appearing, but personally signs and identifies herself as applicant's attorney. So the question is, who is the attorney of record, and is this properly signed? And pretend there's some Jeopardy, Final Jeopardy music going on right now. <laughs> I don't think the agency uh, licensed the music. <laughs> right. <laughs> so we have to pretend. <laughs> so are we done the polling? Like we have a 60 40 split there. All right. 60% saying or no. Not quite, I guess. So, are we ready for the answer? Yeah. And so the answer is yes. Ivana is an attorney admitted to practice by the highest court of a U.S. jurisdiction and therefore authorized to practice before the USPTO in trademark matters. Her signature is sufficient to be recognized as the attorney of record under 37 CFR section 2.17B12. Looks like we have some of this cock broken off at the end, I'll read it, but, but she will draw a new office action. Um, attorney bar information is required when a new attorney has appeared. She probably could have avoided this office action if she was a little more familiar with the USPTO form. And I'll pass it on. Thanks, Kathleen. All right, let's go to number two here. Uh, in this example, Dewey File 
is designated as attorney of record in an intent to use application for a domestic juristic entity and it's e-signed by Shirley Ugest, the applicant's marketing manager. After a notice of allowance issues, the office first receives a change of address or representation form, appointing carryover, apparently applicant's in-house counsel as the new attorney of record. Uh, the form is signed again by Shirley Ugest, still identifying herself as marketing manager and carryover submits a statement of use the next day. So who is the attorney of record and is this all properly signed? I see we had a comment that said some people previewed our slides so they know the answers and they didn't want to participate in the polls, but I won't tell anybody if you decide to, to do that. I also wanted to mention we're getting a lot of questions about signatures and we'll try to pause after all these hypos to, to answer some of them. All right. Looks like most of you said no. So what's the answer? Well, when David or I are consulted about these signature issues, we take a look at the entire record and we go through each submission to see uh, who was appointed, who signed, and then we follow it all the way through to see where we end up. So let's start with the uh, ITU application. Um, Dewey is designated as the attorney there, so that right off the bat means he's the attorney of record. Uh, it's fine for Shirley Ugest to sign the application as marketing manager because the application, as we said, is a declaration signature. So if she has firsthand knowledge or and uh, implied or actual authority, which we presume in most cases, she can sign the application. So so good good so far. Um, so let's talk about the uh, change of address or representation form. Uh, now we know there's already an attorney of record. Shirley Ugest signs the CAR form appointing uh, carry over, uh, but there's already an attorney of record. So that means anyone who signs that has to have the proper authority uh, on behalf of the juristic entity to sign. And mar marketing manager, as we said, is not going to cut it. So cannot appoint carryover. Um, so Dewey file remains the attorney of record. But then we have a statement of use, and carryover s submits that and presumably signs it. That's okay. She can sign the statement of use uh, because, again, like applications, the signature in the statement of use is a declaration signature. So kind of a, a weird result there, uh, but. These these can be tough. I think uh, Dewey file is going to be he's going to be very surprised to get the registration certificate, thinking that carryover should be getting it, but um, that's the likely outcome here. All right. Um, so let's do a couple more. Um, an individual applicant domiciled in the U.S. submits an application signed by attorney I forget, whose information is filled into the attorney field. Of course, I forget, living up to his name, abandons the application, which only required a new specimen. A timely petition to revive is submitted with a new specimen and a properly worded declaration signed by registration applicant's uncle, um, with a submission signature by Billum Often, attorney at law, who appears to be from a different firm than Mr. Forget. Uh, so let's try this one. Who's the attorney of record and is this one properly signed? I'm not sure if the poll is updating. There we go. So 
Uh, close split, most people think no, but in this case, actually maybe a surprising yes. Um, the reason is that when the application abandoned, Mr. Forget's power of attorney automatically ended. So the properly worded declaration came from registration applicant's uncle. And as we mentioned before, a declaration is a verification of facts, which can be signed by anybody with, with firsthand knowledge. So unless we have evidence to the contrary, we're going to presume that Mr. Strachan um, can sign the verification of facts. Billum Often was named in a document submitted to the office, um, submitted by, by a person with apparent authority to do so. So we're, we're going to assume that Bill Often is now the attorney of record. Um, so maybe a surprise result, but uh, again, that flexibility of the revised 2.17b 2 um, at play. All right, um, passing it back to Bob. All right, an example for a juristic applicant domiciled in the U.S. submits an application signed by Anna Turney, general counsel, who does not enter, enter her name in the attorney field. A response is subsequently filed making several amendments signed by Noah Little of Sanction Law Group, who does enter his attorney information in the attorney field. Who is the attorney of record here, and is this all properly signed? So maybe the uh, maybe the names here give give something away. We'll see. And again, we will we will pause to uh, answer some questions that we're seeing come in. Okay, pretty pretty evenly split here. We have 69 saying yes, 53 saying no. Let's see. No. So an attorney signed it as general counsel. In that case, we can presume that general counsel identifies an attorney. So assuming a, a an attorney is admitted to the United States, she is the primary attorney of record. Uh, because the initial application was a document signed by an attorney on behalf of an otherwise unrepresented applicant. Um, so once we have a recognized attorney, Noah Little cannot submit the response unless either being appointed by, unless he's either appointed by someone with legal authority to bind the applicant or an attorney grants an associate power of attorney to him. I'll turn it back over to David. All right, we're almost there. This is the last one of these, and then we'll pause for some questions. And uh, don't feel bad if you're getting some of these wrong. These are the tough ones. We we are um, we're, we're trying these these uh, difficult ones. Um, so we have a juristic applicant domiciled in the U.S. and submits an application naming I'm a Sue Yu from Hershkowitz and Marsh as the attorney of record. The application is signed by Justin Case, trademark coordinator. After we get the after the issuance of an office action. Um, we get a car form, a change of address or representation form, signed by Willie Notice, Chief In-House Counsel. In the form, Bet It's Bad, from I Can't Believe It's a Law Firm, is named as the new attorney of record. Bet then later files a response. So is this one properly signed? I think the names are... are Big hint here. <laughs> so, a few more seconds. And we really do appreciate you all playing along with this. Okay, so as uh, as most of you 
noticed, uh, yeah, the, the names give it away here. Uh, no, this is not properly signed. So I'm a CU is still the attorney of record because the application's properly signed. Just in case the tra trademark coordinator can sign a uh, verification of facts. But Willie Notice can't sign a new car form because he, he there's no indication that he's the corporate officer or the equivalent. Um, so Beth's response can't be accepted because there's already a recognized attorney from a different firm. Um, this could have been fixed if, if Willie Notice had signed as chief in-house counsel and corporate secretary, uh, chief legal officer, some title that gave him uh, some sort of officer level uh, authority. Okay, I'm going to pass it back to Bob. I think we're going to pause for some questions for some questions here, though. Yes. So going all the way, we we had quite a few, and I think some of them related to the earlier, much earlier slides. Um, let's see. This one says, as it relates to signatures, we know that under the rules. What the requirements are, however, in remedying the situation was the USPTO's position for a registered mark. Um, since the USPTO will not invalidate the mark, making additional filings only hurts the clients. Is there an appetite to change the requirements to loosen them? Why do we require a power of attorney for existing applications to be signed by the client but not for new applications? So in terms of remedy, remedying a, an improper signature when something's already registered, uh, we, as you know, we when we talk to attorneys on the outside, we let them know that that's a decision that they have to uh, make with their client, uh, because there is the Section Seven presumption of validity validity uh, by the office, and we try not to enter anything into the record ourselves that would, you know, potentially call into question the validity of the registration. Uh, but to the uh, extent that an attorney in his or her client wants to kind of clarify the record, they are permitted to do that um, by filing something uh, post-registration, you know, attempting to sort of cure the record however they want to do it. But again, that's a decision that the client and the attorney have to make because once you've sort of uh, called in to question the signatures that um, were made prior to registration, that could potentially open you up to um, you know, some third party uh, attacks on the registration. Um, in terms of changing the requirements to, to loosen them, we don't have any particular plans to do so right now. Um, we do want to sort of maybe help clarify some of the rules in the future um, because we know that they, they can be very complicated. Uh, in terms of the question of why we require a power of attorney for existing applications to be signed by the applicant but not for new applications, well, in new applications, at that point, the applicant is essentially unrepresented, um, and therefore, an appearance under our rules, a designation even without signature, counts as designating an attorney. Um, however, if there's already an attorney appointed, we need someone who has the proper legal authority on behalf of the client to revoke the previous attorney and appoint a new one. But of course, as David mentioned, if there's already an attorney of record and that attorney wants to uh, appoint associate powers of attorney, they are welcome to do that. Um, was there anything else, David, that you'd add to that? No, no I know there was a lot it. there. Um, yeah. Um, if I could answer the next one, I think we had two related questions about, about when representation automatically ends. Um, so, Again, representation will automatically end upon abandonment of an application, a change of ownership, or registration of the mark. Um, so one question was whether that is an immediate effect, and yes, it's immediate upon abandonment of the application. Um, so if a different attorney were to file the petition to revive, we could treat the applicant as being unrepresented at that point. And again, that's kind of a, it's out of convenience to, to make sure that if the applicant were having some issue with their attorney that, that, that caused the, uh, a, an office action to go unresponded to, that um, it's convenient and easy for them to appoint a new attorney. Um, we had a follow-up question. Another related question was whether what, um, who gets the registration certificate um, if, re if uh, representation ends at registration. Well, it, it goes to the current correspondent of record. 
Um, we leave the attorney information in the record as a courtesy because we do recognize that in many situations um, that representation is going to continue, that the attorney is the one who is acting on behalf of, of, of this now registrant. Um, we do have a tease form that allows an attorney to tell us my representation has ended because the mark has registered or the ownership has changed, so take me out. Um, so it, that can be done, um, but we, we leave it to the attorney to do that. Um, and uh, I'm trying to see if there's any other related question here. Um, yeah, and just to add to that with the rule saying that attorney representation is considered to end on registration and why do we retain the attorney's information. Uh, that was a choice made uh, a long time ago, actually, after we got feedback from um, stakeholders that they would prefer to stay in there um, once they're registered so they could continue to receive correspondence. Uh, but it is, it is an issue that is commonly raised by stakeholders now. Um, um, and we certainly are looking into that and whether there's a better way to do that. We have two very, in rapid succession, there were two questions about who may sign a power of attorney form. Um, one asked to us to confirm that a newly appointed attorney may sign the change of attorney rather than the trademark owner or applicant. And another one asks that they've seen in some cases that the new designated attorney signs him or herself uh, as the new attorney. Is that allowed? Um, so uh, the short answer is no, that is not permitted in an application. Um, in the application stage, the trademark owner, the applicant, is the only one who can revoke an ongoing power of attorney. So the new attorney cannot appoint him or herself as the attorney of record. Post-registration, if an attorney is signing a change of correspondence and essentially saying, I'm submitting this on behalf of, of the registrant, and the new attorney signs that request to update the uh, correspondence address, um, that will essentially appoint the new attorney as the attorney of record. Because again, post-registration, the power of attorney has automatically ended. So um, during the pendency of the application, no, it has to be the trademark owner or somebody with uh, authority to bind a juristic applicant. And I, I I don't think we've answered this yet. The question was, what happens if you have a client sign a statement of use declaration? Is this a violation of 1118 since currently the SOU form doesn't allow the attorney to sign and only has one signature section for the declaration? So that's right. There is only one signature uh, in the SOU form currently, and that's the declaration signature in support of the statement of use. Um, so in that case, it's, that would not be considered a violation, and that's Typically, I think what practitioners would prefer to happen is to have the client who has more knowledge about how the mark is being used file that declaration. Um, and if you read 1118 about having an attorney either sign or include a signature, I mean, I think that's broad enough to, to indicate in situations like this that, you know, there's compliance because they have, you know, uh, affected a signature by having someone else sign it. Is that anything to add to that, David? No, no, that's perfect. Um, okay. we, we also have, got, we have a couple of questions about, um, I think there was some confusion about declaration signatures, about whether who can sign the declaration, whether it's just the applicant or the attorney. Um, for this, I'm gonna point everybody to rule 2.193E um, and that rule contains all of the, everything we're talking about today, about who is allowed to sign for which type of document. It's broken down by document, but essentially a verification of facts can be signed by someone with legal authority to bind the owner, somebody with firsthand knowledge of the facts and, um, and the implied authority uh, to, to sign, and, um, or the attorney. So a declaration can be signed by the broadest group of people, it's just the amendments and things like that where, where, where we require um, if there is an attorney for the attorney to sign. Um, I think we have a few more here. Um, I think we might want to move on since we've got, it's at 345 now. So let's move on and try to get to the 
the rest later. Hang on. All right, moving on to Rule 11.18 in detail. And what we wanted to highlight here is that under Rule 11.18, any party presenting a paper, whether they're a practitioner or non-practitioner, and when we say presenting, we mean signing, filing, submitting, or even advocating um, on, you know, on behalf of someone for that submission, anyone who does that is making certain certifications. Um, first is one you're probably all familiar with, which is the certification or the averiment that all statements made in the submission um, are true and that any sort of willfully false or fraudulent statements or representations are subject to penalties under 18 U.S.C. 1001. Uh, but there's also in B2 uh, the provision that to the best of the party's knowledge, information, and belief formed after an inquiry reasonable under the circumstances that the paper is not being presented for improper purposes and that it's otherwise um, supported it has by evidence. Um, so there's no frivolous um, claims being made. And this sort of, this, um, sort of mirrors you know, professional ethics um, rules like the model code. So the question that would you know occur to most after reading that is, well, what is an inquiry reasonable under the circumstances? We know from case law that reasonable inquiry includes information known or that can be reasonably and readily readily obtained, um, and that generally an attorney may rely on information provided by a properly educated client unless the attorney has reason to believe that such information is inaccurate or incomplete. So. Now, I'd like to open up for at least a brief discussion. Um, what is a reasonable inquiry for attorneys signing declarations supporting specimens, Kathleen? Well, obviously you need to ask the um, whoever's signing if uh, all goods and services are in use in commerce. And for services, as many of our practitioners know, we have to have a, uh, an example for each service. Um, are you really asking this information from the right person. If you're dealing with a foreign associate, has the foreign associate requested the correct information from the client? And if the client does not understand English, have they translated the documents they know what, what they're signing? What would you think is a properly educated client in terms of submitting specimens or, or another submission? Dave, you want to take that? Well, for, you know, when I was in private practice, I, I remember there was an instance where um, where the a client sent us for, uh, for maintenance filing a um, an image that uh, appeared to us to be the same image that was in the original application from 10 years prior. And um, I think there, reasonable inquiry would mean challenging the client and saying, is this still how you're using it? Is it, the same, it appears to be the same image. And in at least one case, it turned out that, no, they weren't using it with those goods and the mark had actually changed. It was a stylized mark. It, it didn't even look like that. And it led to the conversation that maybe we need to file a new application to cover, to cover this new variation of the mark. So um, I think looking at the record is, is really important in these cases. Um, reasonable inquiry means looking critically at what your client is sending you and making sure that um, that it makes sense. I mean, yeah. Common sense is a good so, thing. Right. So it's fair to say that if you have no real idea of how much your client knows about the requirements here, there is some education that you have to do before you can really accept, you know, some of their, their answers, right? Correct. Right. Okay. All right, why don't we move on to the next slide. And I am collecting more of these questions, by the way, everybody. So uh, when we get to the end, we can do that again. So, 
when we're talking about Rule 1118, there um, there's two two big parts of it. We talked about 1118A briefly. B is what Bob was just talking about. Rule 1118C uh, deals with violations of the of our rules, and um, if you if one violates Rule 1118B, um, sanctions could include things like striking the paper, referring conduct to to OED, the Office of Enrollment and Discipline. Um, precluding parties from submitting documents or presenting or contesting issues, affecting the weight given to the paper, or in the most egregious cases, um, the office can terminate the proceedings. Um, and for practitioners, very important is actually 1118D, just a reminder that anybody who's filing anything before the office is subject to the jurisdiction of the office. And OED can, um, can uh, bring about disciplinary actions for the purposes of the USPTO, but can also contact state bars, and um, uh, there is reciprocal discipline. And we're passing to Kathleen. Okay, so now we're going to discuss um, our proof of use audit. Um, post registration submission. So, who should sign a Section 8 or 71 affidavit? The attorney, in house counsel, a person having first hand knowledge of the facts. So, essentially, the declarant is attesting that one, the mark is in use with all of the goods and services identified in the declaration, and two, the specimen shows the mark as currently used in commerce on or connection with the goods or services. Um, if, if there's, I think there's very many experienced practitioners listening, and we know that sometimes your clients want to maintain a historical registration, and sometimes they just can't because they don't have current, uh, currently used goods and ser or services in commerce. Um, we'll discuss uh, excusable non-use um, in one or two more slides. So. The signatory to a Section 8 or 7 affidavit is certifying that, to the best of the signatory's knowledge, information, and belief formed after an inquiry reasonable under the circumstances, the factual contentions have evidentiary support. Most importantly, the signatory is also subject to penalty of perjury for knowingly and willfully making false statements or representations to the office. As many of you know, USPTO began a post-registration specimen pilot program in 2012, and then it was made permanent in 2017. Under the Proof of Use Audit Program, the USPTO may cancel audited registrations with unsubstantiated use claims or to delete unsupported goods or services. Since implementation, over 50% of audited registrations are either canceled or have goods or services removed. Obviously, the troubling statistics to date suggest lack of care, lack of knowledge about what the law requires, or both. So, audit directions are required to submit proof of use for additional goods and services in the registration. If registrants delete those goods or services, they are then required to provide proof of use for all goods or services. As many, many of you know, in our proposed rulemaking, uh, there's a zero fee for Section 7 amendment requesting deletion of goods or services prior to an audit and no additional fees for deleting goods and services currently with the submission of a Section 871 affidavit. But $200 class via T's for deleting goods or services, importantly, after submission and prior to acceptance of the Section 8 or 71 affidavit. So the attorneys have a responsibility to confirm that the mark is in use for each goods and service listed in the registration before signing or filing the declaration of use. So have registrants consulted with sales records to determine if there are ongoing sales of each listed good and service. Confirm with your client that sales are for goods, services sold in connection with the mark shown in the registration. And consider if there is non-use and it may be excusable. Um, for those of you who may be new to trademark practice, some examples are 
catastrophes like fires or natural disasters or uh, trade embargo or uh, the severe illness or death of a person that's in, mainly involved in the, the business. So there are there are ways to prove um, excusable non-use, but the, the bar is pretty high. Most importantly, attorneys or registrants who routinely delete goods or services after audit may be referred for discipline. Okay. So tips for successful post-registration submissions. Again, confirm that specimens show legitimate use in commerce. Make reasonable inquiry into how the registrant is using the mark. Consider using checklists for particularly long edifications or, or goods and services that may be difficult to, to read. For instance, is your client a pharmaceutical company or a uh, chemical company that has a very long list of goods and you might want to have a checklist? Prepare for a possible audit by suggesting clients keep updated documentation of use in connection with goods or services. Photograph the mark on products. Web page examples with the URL and date visible, or invoices or photographs of goods being boxed for transport. Copying on to five. So we're going to jump very quickly to addressing misconduct in trademarks. Um, what are we doing? Well, when we're talking about uh, misconduct involving attorneys, the first thing we do is to ask, is this really the attorney? Um, where we have evidence that suggests that an attorney's information has been used without that attorney's knowledge or consent, we immediately investigate. We try to attempt to contact that attorney um, and um, we try to fix that <laughs> essentially as quickly as possible. Um, if we can't reach an attorney or we're just not sure, and we're talking about applications, we might have an examining attorney actually request additional bar admission information on a case-by-case -case basis to make sure that we're actually dealing with the real attorney. Um, where an attorney is improperly signing submissions and it's a pattern of behavior, uh, we will refer attorneys to the Office of Enrollment and Discipline. Um, as I mentioned before, OED does have the power and authority to suspend practitioners and can refer conduct uh, to an attorney state bar for reciprocal discipline. Um, the Commissioner for Trademarks also issues show cause orders in appropriate cases. Um, potentially, that can result in suspension um, from practice in trademark matters. And again, under 1118C, we can end up striking certain documents or terminate a proceeding before the office, again, in the most egregious cases. Um, the office will also refer suspected criminal activity to the Office of the Inspector General and um, sometimes in some cases directly to the Department of Justice. Um, pass to Bob to talk about one particular Thanks, David. Case. Yeah, and I, I think we'd just like to close here with a recommendation to read uh, the uh, exclusion on consent order um, that issued uh, about three, three and a half years ago now uh, for Matthew Swires. Uh, he was an experienced trademark attorney, a uh, high volume filer, uh, but uh, pursuant to the consent agreement, he did not admit any violations of the rules of professional responsibility or the rules of professional conduct, uh, but he did agree to exclusion while a disciplinary complaint was pending against him, alleging at least 31 rules of professional uh, responsibility and rules of professional conduct. Um, so we like to call this the sort of the Baskin Robbins of, of ethics cases. It's got 31 flavors of alleged violations. It's very informative. It gives you a good idea of things that could potentially go wrong uh, when submitting things to the office. Um, with that, we'll close the presentation, but I, I know we do have some questions that even though we're at the four o'clock hour, I think we can try to uh, answer at least some of those. Uh, I know there was a question about the auditing process and whether it's truly random and how they're selected. Um, so a, a registration can be audited if a Section 8 or Section 71 declaration is timely filed 
and the registration includes at least one class with four or more goods or services, or at least two classes with two or more goods or services. Um, so that's how those are selected. And then in that case, if they are selected, additional proof of, of use is required. So we, we received, um, I've been collecting some of these. I could ask, uh, ask them, anybody jump in to, to answer. Um, one question we got, we had, we received is, if use only requires an offer of goods for sale, why must actual sales be confirmed? Um, I can answer this one right away. I think that uh, the person asking this might be um, conflating the patent standard with the trademark standard. Um, under uh, Section 45 of the Trademark Act, use in commerce for goods uh, requires that the mark is placed in any manner on the goods or their containers or displays um, or the tags or labels affixed thereto um, or in, for impractical cases on documents associated with the goods and the goods are sold or transported in commerce. An offer for sale is not necessarily use in commerce. Um, we received a question, uh, is a qualified U.S. attorney required in the case of a Madrid protocol designation that does not present anything requiring an office action? Bob, do you want to field that one? Um, sorry, I was reading some of the other oh, questions. <laughs> But in, in a Madrid protocol designation uh, that does not present anything requiring an office action, is a qualified U.S. attorney required? Uh, well, no. If it's if it's something that would otherwise be approved for publication, then that's probably what the examining attorney is going to do. Um, if if there's an office action, that's when the the requirement would be made. I hope that answers the question. I'm not sure that was a question or not. Yeah, I think I think it falls into that exception in the examination guide. Uh, right. for that one. Yeah. Right. Um, for U.S. domiciled clients, if they happen to be outside the United States when they sign the declaration, does that matter, or do they need to be in the United States with a U.S. IP address when they sign? You, you know, want to take that, David? Well, oh, sure. <laughs> I, um, um, so. There's no, there's nothing in the rules that requires that a party be in a specific location for signing. The matter, when we're talking about the domicile rule and the U.S. Council rule for domicile, that's a question of where the applicant is actually domiciled. If somebody's on vacation outside the country and signs a document from outside the country, that's fine. They can do that. Um, if there is no attorney of record, is it possible for an attorney to sign and file the POA? So that again, that's uh, 217 uh, B2, <laughs> B2A2. Um, so yes, if the if the applicant is unrepresented, um, then the uh, attorney who signs a POA essentially is appearing on behalf, is signing a document on behalf of an otherwise unrepresented applicant. And yes, uh, that that is acceptable. Um, so let me see. We we have um, we have a couple of questions about ownership changes. Um, if a client sells their trademark, can the attorney representing the client submit the assignment agreement and then withdraw representation, or does the new owner need to submit and sign the assignment? Um, similarly, if during the pendency of the application there's an assignment of the application, who may sign the change of power of attorney? Bob, do you want to take that or you want me to? Well, there's a, there's a couple things there, right? Well, we know that um, abandonment and ownership changes are triggering events for power of attorney. So those cause power of attorney to end. Uh, the assignment uh, question is a little bit more complicated um, and bearing in mind that assignments at the office are sort of a recordal process. There's not a lot of substantive examination that goes into them, but typically I think what you want to see in assignment is a, a proper conveyance of the interest uh, to the party. So who's, who's filing it, whether it's the old attorney or new attorney, is not typically something that we would look into um, unless there's some other sort of red flags going on. Um, and we also had a question about SOUs. Are attorneys referred to OED if they delete goods in a statement of use? Uh, 
I understand why they may be if they are deleted post audit, but what about during prosecution? Sometimes clients drop items they truly did intend to use earlier. No, I mean, that's not typically a, uh, a, a problem. That's what we want attorneys to do. They want We want them to check with their clients before filing statement of use to make sure that everything that's listed in the notice of allowance is, is in use, and if it's not, to delete the ones that are not. So, no, that would not trigger an, an OED referral. All right, let's see, we have, um, if an attorney left the firm, but the firm is going to continue to represent the client and in the application, is the CAR form required? Is the applicant's signature required? Um, so generally, if the um, if the firm is continuing representation, we, we say normally if the attorney and the firm leaves the firm, that at that moment, we will essentially allow the attorney to update and say that here's my new firm information. <laughs> Or we will presume that somebody signing from the same firm that the attorney was at earlier um, is just updating to, to name a new attorney within the same firm. So generally, um, I, those are sticky, um, but generally we will um, we'll presume that if, uh, if a new attorney at the same firm is signing the car form, that all they're doing is changing around who's listed on top, and um, that's acceptable. We will normally take that. Also, I know you can file in the application, you know, a power of attorney listing six people, and that gives right. the examining attorney a cause to, to know that they're authorized. It's, it's good practice in general to use that field when you're filing an application or, or updating correspondence where, it, where there are additionally appointed attorneys. It's helpful to the office because it tells us these people are explicitly permitted to, to file documents. Um, what can happen in some cases, if you get an examining attorney who's just not sure, they're going to end up issuing an office action, and you know, you can head that off by filling in that information. So it's a good point, Kathleen. Um, is it acceptable for someone to sign on behalf of a juristic applicant on the basis that they have power of attorney to sign trademark documents on behalf of the party, but are not U.S. attorneys and do not, and do not have firsthand knowledge of the facts? Um, I think that's just a no. Um, <laughs> who's not an attorney and doesn't have is not the applicant and does not have first-hand knowledge of the facts. No, they cannot sign. Yeah, and I think there was a related question about foreign counsel. They sometimes are delegated the authority to sort of act on behalf of the foreign juristic entity. Is that would we consider that someone under our rules who has legal authority to bind and? and Generally, the answer to that is no. We do get asked about that from time to time. What we're typically looking for there is um, the authority to be set forth in the the organizing documents or bylaws uh, or, or the equivalent. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. We're receiving several questions now about um, extensions of time to file the statement of use and who can sign those. And uh, mm -hmm. generally, th those are, uh, I believe, those are um, verification because it's a uh, extension of the um, statement of use. That's uh, anybody with first-hand knowledge, the the applicant themselves, um, or an officer, or the attorney is permitted to sign those. Um, we do have a tricky one here that, um, that I'd like to pose to everybody. This is a bigger hypothetical, maybe. Some corporations grant members of their in-house legal departments power to sign POAs and certain documents such as declarations on behalf of the company. Um, they may not even, the in-house legal team may not even be lawyers, or if they are, may, they may not be corporate officers. If the signatory has been granted power by the company, how can that be effectively communicated to the USPTO? And I think my take on this, and, and we, we may have differing minds here, but my take is that I don't think that that matters for our purposes. Um, we we have to be objective about how about these these signatures. If a person is signing a POA, a, a revocation of another attorney and appointing another a different person, um, for it depends on the entity type what title we're going to accept. Um, so just because in-house somebody has made the determination that 
this person is authorized, that's not going to cut it for us. Yeah, and we do see in, in response to questions from examining attorneys, we do see uh, attorneys and applicants submitting, you know, contracts or agreements that say basically that the juristic entity has designated this person to act on their behalf in these circumstances. But again, what we're generally looking for there is is the authority to have been granted in the organizing documents or the bylaws. Uh, of the of the entity, so we typically don't accept those sort of um, extensions of authority to to others. Um, similar question is by somebody else a different situation, where all of the in-house counsel are also granted officer titles, and um, so when they file, they don't they don't actually fill in the attorney information. And they don't believe that these are the attorneys of record, but these people are signing the, the applications and responses. How do they avoid um, office actions uh, requiring bar information and the like? Um, so I, I think here it, it really depends on how the person is identified in the application. If the, if the person is signing the application as an officer, then the examining attorney is not necessarily going to be clued in that this is an attorney. If the person is signing as trademark counsel, um, then they're signing with a title that suggests that this is the attorney and the attorney is representing this applicant and therefore they're going to require that bar information. Um, even with mixed titles, I, I, I believe most examining attorneys would require the bar information. So to avoid that, um, the, the in-house counsel should use their corporate, um, corporate title instead. Um, we had a question about the notice of proposed rulemaking and the link to, the, um, to that. Um, I will say I believe that that proposed rulemaking, um, we, we had the proposed rule was previously issued. The, the final rule is forthcoming. I don't believe that it's, it's yet published. So um, you'll have to keep an eye out for that. All right. It just cleared OMB uh, yesterday. Okay. Yeah, so uh, soon, is the, soon. Yeah. we could say. Um, let's see. Um, we have some, some later uh, questions here. Is it permissible to use a care of language for the owner address? So, um, Generally, no. Um, a care of address is not the applicant's domicile address as it's defined in the rules. However, um, there are circumstances where, where, the, um, where that information, a post office box or a care of address, might need to stay in the record. Um, the forms do have a place to indicate domicile apart from the, uh, the, applicant, the, owner, the owner's uh, correspondence information. Um, so we recommend in most cases that you provide the domicile separate from that care of or post office address. In the rare circumstances where placing the address in the record would be uh, harmful to the applicant or registrant for some reason, uh, generally those are handled on petition. And we suggest that after you file the petition that you contact the, uh, the customer service line to let us know so that if something needs to be handled uh, Immediately, we can we can handle that for you. Um, Got another question about the physical location of the person when they sign. Uh, does it matter where the client is physically located when signing? For example, if the client is U.S. domicile but is traveling through Europe, should the attorney now sign because the client is uh, momentarily based outside of the U.S. when signing? Uh, no. And we don't, that's not, it's, there's no requirement for the person signing to be um, in the U.S. when they sign. The only uh, caveat to that to watch out for is that if it's late at night in the United States um, and the <laughs> applicant is in Europe and signs or in Asia and signs, uh, pay attention to the date. Uh, you may draw an office action if it appears that the document was um, was signed the day after the, the office received it. Um, and you can run into uh, filing date problems uh, or, or deadline problems if you wait too long, uh, if it's the other direction. 
So um, just be aware of that. Uh, generally, a statement that's that could be cleared up with a miscellaneous statement. If if it's a response to office action or some other form that has that, you can indicate that um, the, that the signatory was um, was in a different time zone that caused that issue. Um, let's see. We have. A uh, question about what to do if the law firm goes out of business and the attorney leaves the practice of law. Um, if the attorney is leaving the practice of law and there are ongoing applications, I would imagine that that's a situation where the attorney should be requesting to withdraw um, from any active uh, files and active application or registration that the attorney is uh, currently um, the attorney of record in. Um, very often that that should require that the attorney is talking to their client and, and is passing over the files. Uh, if a new attorney is taking over the business, uh, generally we'll st we would still need some sort of um, revocation and appointment of the attorney signed by the applicant for ongoing applications. Um, sorry, there, we do have a lot of a lot of questions here we're sorting through, so apologies. Uh, will this webinar be made available for viewing later? Uh, yes, uh, we, we will have a recording posted. Um, oh, we had a question about Canadian attorneys representing Canadian applicants. Um, so the question was, why are Canadian attorneys allowed to represent Canadian applicants for US trademark registration at the USPTO? This is a complicated uh, question with a complicated answer. Um, the Office of Enrollment and Discipline does have limited recognition of uh, Canadian practitioners representing uh, Canadian applicants. Uh, however, the U.S. Council rule uh, um, essentially changes that dynamic a little bit. A Canadian applicant or registrant is still required to have U.S. counsel. Canadian re recognized Canadian practitioners who are registered with OED are able to do limited representation. They're able to do some of the things that we, uh, as the, the initial slides indicated, uh, we consider practice before the office, which includes advising clients and preparing documents. But the U.S. attorney is the one who needs to do the actual submission of these documents. So a little bit complicated. Um, So we had a question about um, reporting fake specimens. Um, they note that there, for pending applications, there's a TM specimen protests email pilot program available where third parties can report those. Is there a, a similar email uh, box for post registration? Um, and there is not, um, but we will look into that. We, there's a question about um, uh, post-registration and what the use period is. Uh, what is the time period during which the sales must have been made? Is it the relevant period any time during the one-year period during the which the declaration is due? Uh, yeah, that is generally the answer there. Um, what the statute requires is, is for you to say that use has been made in that statutory period. Um, so hopefully that generally answers the question. Let's see, can an applicant sign the renewal even when represented if there is only one declaration signature section as well, or does the attorney need to sign? Well, generally when we're at the renewal stage, um, uh, with, with some exception, uh, generally representation will have likely ended by as a matter of law. So um, because we're we're usually post uh, post registration or post the fi filing of some sort of maintenance document um, before another one is due. But there are circumstances where an attorney may have reappeared in the record. Um, generally, for a declaration, even if somebody is represented, the the person signing a verification of facts may may actually sign. 
and again, with a lot of these uh, signature questions, I do direct everybody to Rule 2.193. That's 37 CFR 2.193. Um, which does contain substantive uh, direction over uh, you know, which person in which circumstance for which document. Did we answer this one? Is it good practice to have authorized client representatives directly sign applications, SOUs, in Section 8 filings via the email signature link in T? What do we think about that? I think there's a couple things to consider there. Yeah, I think that that raises, uh, that's a good ethics question. Um, you know, just because the attorney can sign the document uh, doesn't mean the attorney should sign the document in every case. Um, you know, the attorney, again, is, is signing um, under 1118B, uh, they're saying that they've made reasonable inquiry, that they that they believe the statements are true, that, that uh, the statements are made with knowledge, uh, that you know, understanding that, that they're subject to penalties of perjury. Um, so if the attorney's not sure that, that and, or doesn't have the opportunity to make inquiry, maybe the attorney shouldn't sign. Um, and that's a situation where it probably makes more sense to have the client sign. Is that, Kathleen, what do you think? Because coming from private practice also, Right, I agree. We had uh, just now a, a question about uh, what happens uh, to documents submitted by non-attorney foreigners um, who may be using fake attorney information. Um, so fake information provided to the office is going to be subject to sanction um, under 1118C. Uh, these are situations that where we're, where we're talking about fake, uh, fake attorney information, that's egregious conduct. I think in most cases, that's gonna result in something like a show cause order and the commissioner potentially ordering termination of the proceedings. Um, for anybody who, who may be involved, that's the type of conduct, too, that can end up being referred to OED or potentially a, a uh, um, referral to a criminal investigator. Let's see. Um, Here's an in interesting one. Um, assume I have a suitable specimen showing use on one product for the class, but now I'm conducting due diligence for the remaining items in the class for the Section 8 filing. I can see the products offered for sale on the client's website, but the website itself would not qualify as an acceptable online point of sale display. I cannot see the mark actually affix the goods in the picture on the website. Must I ask the client to send pictures that show the mark affixed every single one of those goods or their packaging? Kathleen, what do you what do you think of that? What would you have done um, in your prior life as a outside <laughs> practitioner? Wow. Uh, I think it would, it, well, obviously, you know, there could be one specimen to support, you know, goods in, in one class. It's, goods are different. So um, unless it's something very sophisticated, like computer hardware, software, chemicals, I might do that. But if it's like you know, something simple like clothing or uh, paper products, I think I would go with what the client said. David? Yeah, I, I think reasonable inquiry here um, would be yeah. satisfied. Um, if you believe that your client is actually selling these things, even if you can't get a good specimen yourself from the website, um, I think reasonably if you were audited, you'd, you'd have uh, a high likelihood of being able to get a specimen from the client. So I think you'd be fine. And I used to represent a chemical, chemical client, and we would do uh, uh, declarations from the president attesting to the fact that they're being shipped in containers and the mark's not on it, and that usually was sufficient to, to explain why there's no actual physical specimen. Um, we received a question about um, doing a change of representation after taking over from a different firm. Uh, who, who can sign 
Again, um, these are situations where when you're changing representation, if the representation was ongoing, then the the applicant or registrant must sign. If the if the uh, if the representation has ended as a matter of law, then the the attorney can sign, but only in those limited circumstances. Um, to the uh, person who, who uh, thanked us for the uh, funny names in the hypotheticals, uh, we, we appreciate your, your compliments on that. That, that uh, took some thoughtful that preparation. Fit. All David, he gets the credit and the blame. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, looks like we have time for maybe a couple more. Yeah, it looks like it. Uh, thanks for everybody. Apologies yeah. for the for the delays here between we're, we're just, we are reading the questions as they come in. Um, let's see. What about this? Is, in the absence of a reason to think that a client is lying, should an attorney be able to rely on representations from the client to sign, provided the legal standard for submitting SOU declarations, et cetera, are provided to the client? What do we think about that? I don't think it's that broad. I, I think the rule requires reasonable inquiry. Um, you know, <laughs> Unfortunately, um, clients don't always tell the truth, and they're not always forthcoming with information. Um, I think mm -hmm. the, if the attorney is signing, for certainly um, I'd want to make sure um, if I were signing on behalf of my, my client, I would want to make sure that, uh, that I was reasonably certain that I wasn't submitting something false to the office. Yeah, and I think as as a matter of of good practice, um, and you know, you or Kathleen can can chime in, but it's probably good to document some of these things. You know, what did what did you do in terms of due diligence, and in terms of reasonable inquiry before you submitted something or signed something? I think that's just good practice, and it's sort of an insurance policy in case anything comes into question later. That's great. Yes, yeah, great practice. Doesn't take a lot of time, so. Um, if we have a U.S. LLC, but the actual domicile is outside the United States, what can they sign? Um, so, the you're talking about a, a foreign domiciled uh, company, even though it's formed in the United States. If it's uh, domicile, as defined under our rule, is outside the United States, they need a U.S. attorney. Um, so that means the documents that should be signed by an attorney. Um, need to be signed by that attorney. A document, though, that is that that the applicant can sign would be something like the revocation and appointment of a new attorney. The the applicant is still responsible for signing those. Um, the applicant can still also sign a declaration or verification of fact. Um, and if it's a mixed submission, that's the situation where you might have the the applicant sign the verification, the declaration statement, but they have the attorney sign the submission. Again, certain forms that applies to. Um, but um, yeah, the, the interplay doesn't change for if if the company is represented by an attorney. Um, doesn't matter if the company is inside the United States or outside the United States. The attorney is the one who should be submitting anything that that's an amendment or change to the to the application or registration. Um, we've had some COVID-related questions. I think that might be a good thing to finish up on. Um, just to re generally, maybe we could, Bob, if maybe you could um, address our COVID relief and what the office has done. Uh, well, yeah, I think in the in the past we did have some COVID relief in terms of extension of deadlines. Um, so those come into play in, in certain circumstances. We've also had some initiatives, um, including um, you know, petitions to make special for certain COVID-related goods and services where you could maybe advance those to assignment to an, of an, to an examining attorney um, a little bit more quickly than usually um, would, ha would occur. Uh, but I cannot look to see what the specific questions about COVID were because so, <laughs> my questions are not um, advancing. So... Um, we do have quite a bit of information on the website if if, if you need um, to to have that information and 
as I think we've said at the beginning, if there are any questions that we didn't answer here or that occur to you later, please feel free to send them to tmpolicy at uspto.gov. Can you advance the slide one more? I think it has the email. There we go. Thank you to everyone for attending our presentation today. You should already have received an email with the survey. We hope that you will complete the survey to let us know how we did today and any suggestions for future webinar topics. For those viewing the recorded version of this presentation, please feel free to email your feedback and suggestions to tm underscore webinar at uspto.gov. Thank you and have a great rest of your day.